Hey, listeners, thank you so much for listening to HRN. We want to make your experience as a listener even better, and to help us do that, we'd love your input on our audience survey. It'll only take a few minutes, and by completing it, you can enter to win a $250 gift card from Goldbelly. Visit heritageradionetwork.org survey to take the survey and to help us keep growing and improving. That's heritageradionetwork.org survey. Thanks for your support. You're listening to Heritage Radio Network. Whether you're a chef or just love going to restaurants, you know the best ingredients are everything, especially when it comes to beef. In Northern Australia, there's a different approach to raising high-quality beef. Westholm, based in Queensland and Northern Territory, is working with the land to create nature-led Australian Wagyu. Westholm stewards 16 million acres of rangeland guided by their natural ecosystem. They're led by a belief that if they balance the needs of their cattle with the needs of the environment, both can thrive. Westholm's team of rangeland experts and nature managers use a variety of tools to monitor and respond to the welfare of the environment, like satellites that assess grass health and on-the-ground research. Cattle are happier when they have the freedom to forage and explore, so Westholm ensures that they can roam wild, foraging at will for the first two to three years of their lives. Their cows graze on native grasses like Mitchell grass, which is only found in Australia, along with dozens of other plants, herbs, and seasonal legumes. The result is a high-quality Wagyu beef that reflects the terroir of Northern Australia and a flavor suited to complement any cuisine. West Home believes that when nature leads, flavor follows. Learn more at westhome.com. Hello, welcome to Japan Eats. I'm your host, Aki Koteyama, a food writer and director of the New York Japanese Culinary Academy, which promotes deep understanding of Japanese cuisine in America. We are broadcasting live from Brooklyn, New York. This show is all about Japanese food and food culture. We see sushi at every day in the supermarket, but what is beyond sushi? We hear dashi, mame, and izakaya, but what exactly are they? Japanese food is still a mystery for many people, and I try to demystify it in this program with my good guests. My guest today is Zanda Soren, who is the founder of Zanda Soren Wines. And Zanda Soren Wines is a unique, petite California Pinot Noir producer whose mission is to create wines that pair exceptionally well with sushi and other Japanese foods without overpowering them. And equally unique is Zanda's background. He spent 20 years at Apple, where he played a pivotal role in helping to develop digital music products like GarageBand, iTunes, and iPod. And since the winery launched、uh, in Japan in 2023, top restaurants like Three Mission Star Sushi Saito, No Code, and Koke have included Zanda's wine on their list. Also, here in the US, his wine became available in the summer of 2024 and is on the list of notable restaurants on the West Coast, such as Ennaka, Single Thread, and Nisei. So, today we'll discuss how Zanda loves Zanda's love for Japanese food started. Why he decided to make his own wine to pair with Japanese food, why Pinot Noir goes very well with Japanese food, tips to pair Japanese food with wine, and much, much more. But before we start, Japan Needs is available on the Heritage Video Network website, as well as on the iTunes, Stitcher, and Spotify as a podcast. So please go to iTunes, Stitcher, or Spotify, whichever you listen to, and subscribe to Japan Needs. And please write a review, we truly appreciate your feedback. And speaking of your feedback, we have a quick favor to ask. We are taking a listener survey, so please go to the Heritage Radio Network website, heritageradionetwork.org slash survey, and you get entered to win a $250 gift card, $250 gift card from Gold Belly. So thank you so much. Again, the website, heritageradionetwork.org slash survey. Thank you so much. Now, let's start a conversation with Zanda Sori. Hello, Zanda. Welcome to the show. Hi, Kiko. So great to be here. Thanks for having me. Yes. So, this is exciting.、Um, this is something people would think, but actually never done. And that's the majority of the trend of the world. But you really created an amazing、uh, wine and red wine to pair with Japanese food. So, so, first of all, to get to know you, where are you from and what did you eat when you grew up? Oh, so I grew up、uh, in Chicago,、uh, kind of the, the North Shore suburbs.、Um, I'm a Gen X, so I kind of grew up、uh, there in the 80s. And I think if you ever saw any movies kind of like Ferris Bueller's Day Off or Sixteen Candles or Breakfast Club, that's almost like exactly what my, <laughs> my upbringing was like.、Um, mm. my, my parents both worked. 
So I was kind of what they would call like a latchkey kid. So I really was responsible for a lot of my own uh, meals, which really were frankly kind of like frozen food and uh, and TV dinners. So I would say like growing up, I wouldn't necessarily uh, compared to being surrounded by all these beautiful farms and stuff in California. Uh, in Chicago, it was really a lot of a lot of frozen food. Mm, interesting, right? Yeah. Are you, and then you go to the opposite. So, um, but as I mentioned earlier, you wine, your wine is made to pair with Japanese food. So, how did you get into Japanese food, going to Chicago, and then Japanese culture as well in the first place? Yeah, there were, it kind of like, um, it grew slowly over time, but we did, strangely enough, like in my, in my very you know, small town, we had a, a Japanese uh, specialty market, kind of an Asian specialty market. And they had a lot of like really cool, like exotic, like ramen, like instant ramen from Japan. So I know a lot of like, you know, college kids like kind of live on like the instant ramen you find in the grocery store. Uh, but these were a little bit more fancy. And I, I was always really intrigued by that. And um, even my parents told me that I would, you know, buy like a tempura mix and I would try like, you know, cooking for them and and making Japanese food. But I think the fascination started that there was a, a, a restaurant called Koto, like the, the stringed, you know, Japanese musical instrument. And it wasn't a sushi restaurant. It was more of just, you know, traditional Japanese food. Um, and again, this is kind of the, the early to mid 80s. And I remember just the first time going there, when you walked in, I, I felt like I was transported to a different place in a different country uh, because they would actually play like traditional Japanese music, like Koto music. But then you would sit down and I just the whole ritual of getting like a hot towel, like the Oshiburi to start your meal and the service that you would get. It was a Japanese owned, you know, like a family that that ran it and the presentation of the food, you know, they would bring like lacquered boxes, and then you would kind of unstack the boxes. So it just, it did something kind of like, you know, it awoken something in me that was really, like I wanted to learn more about kind of the the culture and the people that created that that cuisine. Um, but I also remember just as a kid, I listened, I, I watched a lot of like anime and Japanese TV shows, not necessarily, you know, thinking about the fact that they were from Japan. And then I also remember my, you know, my father uh, would take me to see like uh, Kurosawa films. So in, in a, the original uh, Shogun miniseries from 1980 also made a big impact. So kind of over time, as I as I got towards you know university and I, I took a little bit of a Japanese history courses and some artwork, I just kind of realized it wasn't until I was an adult where I actually went to Japan where everything kind of connected and I realized like, oh, I really, I really like this culture um, ever since I was, uh, I was a kid. Mm, interesting. Yeah, I mean, a lot of people got into um, a Japanese culture through movies and uh, yeah, I, I realized when I was grew up in Japan, I didn't pay attention to Kurosawa and I was like, eh. <laughs> my dad was watching. But now I really understand what's really layering um, underneath the whole scene, uh, each scene has something, cultural connotation and a mindset. So, yeah, it's interesting, right? Like young boy got inspired by such a classic old movie by Kurosawa. So that's very, very inspiring. Yeah, there was something so, about like, I remember seeing the movie like Ron um, and just like the the colorful outfits that they had. And just, of course, the cinematography was amazing. And it just it was it just it just felt a li- you know, obviously very alien for, you know, for the U.S., but really beautiful and steeped in, you could tell, just the, the tradition. Um, and, of course, you know, knowing Japanese history and how the country in a lot of ways was um, kind of shut off for 250, 300 years, it really allowed this, you know, the native culture, you know, of Japan to, to flourish without a lot of outside influence during that time. So I think mm-hmm. making it kind of a special place in the world. Right. So... And uh, as a contrast, you've been highly successful as a business person and you served as a director of the marketing at Apple for nearly 22 years. And what did you like about your job at Apple and how does your experience at Apple help to run your winery now? Yeah, that was a, that was another thing that I would say kind of uh, came out of my, my childhood passions. Um, I was obsessed with computers when I was really young. And I'm, I'm old enough to remember when people did not have computers. And when the first Apple computers came out, I was a total fanboy and I was, I was totally obsessed by them. So <laughs> I'm very fortunate that, you know, my career, I was able to spend over 20 years um, at Apple during the period of kind of, you know, Apple was in big trouble in the 90s. And I got to be there kind of gr- during this golden era of, you know, Apple becoming 
uh, you know, the most innovative uh, company in the world, largely through, you know, starting with music. Um, so I worked on the original um, iTunes and iPod launch. Uh, but most of my career there was spent working on software for musicians like uh, GarageBand to allow people, you know, to be creative and, and, you know, create their own music. But I think, you know, working at Apple, the one thing is like, I just being surrounded by creativity and super talented people that are all very, very passionate about building great things and always pushing for high quality. Um, so, you know, that I think just set a high bar in general. And as you know, the wine project kind of came on the side and we can, you know, talk about the origins of that. But when I eventually, you know, moved from technology into winemaking, I think, you know, very similar. I wanted to create something that was you know, a great product um, that really touched people. And to do that, you know, I had to build a great creative team, both you know, from my winemaker um, and the people that I work with to kind of create the, the visual identity around my wine. Um, so, yeah, it was uh, it was uh, it was fun to be able to try kind of a, a new direction that's very, very different uh, than technology. Mm, interesting. Yeah. Oh, by the way, um, I visited a winery uh, where wine barrels were aged in a small room with music played for 27. And uh, the owner said the subtle vibrations could help wines to age well. So I don't know if you do anything like that, but I'm no, sure. No, I don't know anything is- about that. That's that's fascinating, <laughs> though. It's like it's kind of like when gardeners like talk to their plants, you know, and stuff like that. <laughs> maybe something's happening there that we don't know about. Right. Well, if we'll find that. Maybe we can just experiment <laughs> next vintage. Right. But right. So, um, so you retired from Apple and became full time at the Zanasorn uh, in November 2022. And the running a winery is such a long term project, uh, right? And it's not like a beer making. You have to wait. You have to be really patient uh, with uncertainty. So, when and why did you decide to start your own wine business? Yeah, so and I think you're right. It's it's a very very different business and a very different speed. It moves much slower. And I always tell people that you know when you work in a technology company, um, you can release a software product and then immediately get feedback. And sometimes you're in meetings and it's like, okay, what's the next release? And it could it could even be a few weeks where you have another release coming out. And I think winemaking uh, moves much slower. Like if we make a decision around uh, trying a different block in the vineyard or changing a barrel. I mean, we're talking about like three or four years before we really understand, you know, the the the, the impact of that decision. Um, but in terms of the, the reason that I, I kind of got fascinated by this, uh, a lot of it had to do with moving to California for the job and then, you know, being surrounded by uh, wine. And, you know, I live in San Francisco, but it's very easy to drive to Napa and Sonoma. Um, and I had some university friends who created their own winery. It's called um, Furthermore Wines. And they started uh, in around 2006. And within like a couple of years, almost right away, they were making some of my favorite wines in the world. And it kind of showed me that, you know, this is something that everybody potentially can do because there's um, there's the ability to do like they, they call it custom crush facilities where you have a, a shared facility with other with other wineries and and there's there'll be like a winemaker or an expert there that kind of helps guide through it. So they started doing that and then they were doing such a great job. They eventually started expanding and then they owned their own operation and start, you know, kept making these great wines. So I kind of asked them, I said, hey, can I just do something very, very small on the side and work with you? We're talking about this is 2012. Uh, so it was making a barrel or two, which is 25, 50 cases a year. So really, really tiny and like as kind of a hobby. And what I would do is I would take those bottles and then because I love Japan, I would travel to Japan and then introduce them to chefs and sommeliers and kind of get you know feedback on them. And that was a, you know, a 10 year process of just getting the feedback, getting the validation, finding out what people liked, which, which vineyards, which styles, um, so I think I had the advantage of, you know, building relationships very, very slowly and casually over that 10 year period before really deciding like, hey, this is something I want to do um, and I actually want to start selling it in Japan. And now I already had a network and a community of people that, that knew me and liked what I was doing and were very supportive from, from you know, right out of the gate. 
Mm-hmm. Right, that's interesting because you had to go to Japan often、uh, at Apple too, right? So you have a natural、uh, feedback、uh, loop to be able to reflect next year's vintage and、uh, you can go back and forth. Yeah,、so、I kept like- it pretty, pretty, pretty separate. So if I went for Apple on business, it was about Apple, but then I would always, you know, people joke that、um, I would always take my vacation times and spend time in Japan whenever I could. And I, had, I would have like my top 10 list of all the places in the world I would want to go to. But for whatever reason, Japan was still always number one. So I would always go there, go there first. And、uh, yeah, having my wines, it's almost like a, like a business card, like an expensive, you know, Meishi or business card where I could introduce myself with a, you know, with a fun bottle of wine with my name on it.、Uh, and it opened a lot of doors in the culinary community. Mm, right.、Um, so, the, during that process, since 2012,、uh, it's been、uh, 12 years. So, what was the biggest challenge、uh, during that process of establishing your operation and、uh, making quality wine like you do now? Yeah, I think I, I got very, very lucky because I, I, I think from the beginning, I was working with great vineyards and great winemakers. So, almost right away, you know, when I was going out there, the feedback was really, really good. And I think during、mm. that period, like, I got to try different styles, some that would be a little bit more elegant, some that would be a little bit more bold. But right away, it was always like people were, were very impressed and supportive with what I was doing. I think, in some ways, some of the bigger challenges came later as I started selling wines. You know, unfortunately, in some ways, that, you know, the, the, the yen got a little bit weaker and the dollar got stronger. So when I was kind of, I had my big moment to start launching my wines, I realized I'm already, it's already kind of a premium. You know, boutique wine. <laughs> and then on top of that, with the strong dollar and the weaker yen,、uh, it makes them, you know, a bit, a bit expensive for,、uh, for Japanese customers.、Mm, right. Well, I, mean, I don't want to get too geeky, but, you know,、uh, you have great vineyards, a couple you really well selected, but how do you pick them? Because it's like,、uh, you know, almost the vineyard direction and the soil, everything's almost determined by vineyards, some people say. So how did you pick those? Really、um, selected few vineyards. Yeah, the vineyards, you're right. They're, they're super important. And I think when I, when I was starting to、um, you know, think about making the wines around 2012,、um, I basically blind tasted a whole number of vineyards.、Uh, there were like eight or nine vineyards that I tried. And two years in a row, I blind picked the exact same vineyards, which were all in the central coast of California.、Um, and particularly, I think I was really drawn to. Um, Santa Rita Hills, which is outside of Santa Barbara. And there's something really unique about that area because it's, you know, the whole West Coast of the United States runs north south. And then this area by Santa Barbara where it cuts east west. And then it、mm. kind of changes the whole, you know, the airflow and what happens off of the ocean. So it gets a really, really nice and unique ocean influence. And what I've kind of found out later, so it was basically, I picked it not strategically, just My palate liked those k i n d of wines. And then what that region is known for is people will say like sea spray or saline notes. A lot of times people that know, you know Japanese cuisine will say like nori or you know, seaweed k i n d of elements. And I found that the you know, Japanese chefs and sommeliers also really responded to it because those k i n d of flavors really support umami rich cuisines, which of course Japanese is built around. A lot of you know, umami、mm-hmm. flavor. So, in some ways, I got a little lucky that my palate just happens to like Japanese food in that style. And then, as I started running, you know, running by people, you know, like running by、uh, my wines for feedback,、um, they picked up on that as well. So, my wine program is yeah, there's an emphasis on that region,、um, but also,、uh, you know, we make also,、uh, wines from、uh, the Sonoma Coast as well. So, it's, it's really about coastal, cool climate,、uh, cool climate wines that are. Done in a very elegant way so that they don't overpower、uh, the elegance of Japanese food.、Mm, interesting. You, your intuition knew it. <laughs> so it does <laughs> really make sense. Right. All right. So we'll take a quick break here. And when we come back, we'll discuss why Zander's red wine, Pinot Noir, pairs with Japanese world so well. So please stay with us. Today's program is brought to you by Korin, a supplier of Japanese chef knives and restaurant supplies. Corin is proud of their Japanese culture and traditions, but they want you to know that their products are not just for Japanese restaurants. Their knives and tableware bring out the best qualities of food from every culture and fit into every restaurant from French to Pan Asian to American. And that is why they're located in New York City, where people from every country in the world come to eat. 
Corin's Tribeca showroom is home to the most extensive collection of Japanese chef knives in the world, including Japan. Stop by to view their exquisitely designed tableware and the rarest natural sharpening stones. They have a whole range of knife services from repair and rust removal to reshaping and realigning. Corin is dedicated to this ideal, bringing the highest quality Japanese design to your table so you can experience the unparalleled quality of Japanese craftsmanship in your home or restaurant. For more information, visit Corin.com. Welcome back. You're listening to Japan Meets on Heritage Twitter Network, HRN. I'm your host, Taki Katayama, and my guest today is Zanda Soren, who is a founder of Zanda Soren Wines. And Zanda Soren Wines is a unique, petite California Pinot Noir producer whose mission is to create wines that pair well with sushi and other Japanese food. So let's talk about food pairings here. So what are the essential flavor components of Japanese food that you love personally? Um, so, yeah, I think that one, one thing I'll say is that I, I like a lot of different Japanese foods. And um, there's, you know, I, I kind of approach this with a little bit of like, hey, that these wines are great for, you know, fine dining and for sushi. But I'm, I'm just as happy to go to an izakaya or obanzai or just more casual kind of local places. Um, but I think, yeah, I think the, the, the wines are designed to pair with a wide variety of foods. Um, I think there are some like local favorites that I really like and things that you can't get in the U.S. A um, couple flavors in particular when, that I really feel like when I'm in Japan, I don't get as much in the U.S. would be like uh, yuzu, you know, the citrus, um, kind of fresh sancho pepper or flower those like anytime like I smell and experience those things uh, in Japan or at a really good restaurant in the U.S. that can source that, it makes me feel like, you know, I, I'm in Japan. Um, but I also like dishes like uh, I always people ask me like, hey, what are some Japanese foods that you like? And I'll say like shirako is one of my favorites, which is, you know, I think milt uh, or cod sperm sack is the you know, the full definition. And people are always very surprised to hear that. But uh, yeah, it's a, it's a very kind of like savory flavor that actually does really, really well with uh, with Pinot Noir. Mm, interesting, right? I mean, I, this shirako sounds like, if you just describe in English, that sounds a little weird, but it's like uh, eating uh, air or crab, and I really like the fluffiness and uh, the whole texture really extend the flavor of what you drink with. So, yeah, I understand shirako is really such a delicacy. Well, it's um, also funny because because there's a little bit of a, you know, <laughs> people aren't used to eating that in the description. You know, so so I, it's it's interesting to watch chefs with Westerners describe the dish because sometimes they'll dance around it. They'll say like, they'll say like, Oh, it's uh, you know, it's male caviar. And then you'd be like, Oh, male caviar. So then, and then you think for a second, wait a second, what do you mean male caviar? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Don't ask too much. Right? <laughs> right, exactly. yeah, that's funny. Yeah. But it's such an important, um, one of the most popular uh, ingredients in kaiseki cuisine, and it's really white, beautiful. So, yeah, I think everybody should try it. And the texture, again, is so delicate. So, Yeah, it's great oh, with ponzu. So, it's great tempura, fried. There's so, yeah, so many different ways that, yeah, I really I really love that dish. Mm, right. Yeah, that's a good point, right? Ponzu and also citrus. So you mentioned yuzu. So yeah. Japanese citrus tend to be, um, it's more ephemeral, Kind of like there's an impact, but kind of like goes away quick and don't go, but uh, it goes away quick. And I right. used to really have a strong impression with it. So maybe right. it's like a something, a key element to go well with your mind. So why do you think we don't have to stick with sake or shochu for pairing with Japanese food? Because that's, that's instantly people, Japanese food, sake, sake, Japanese food. In any other words, what, what is the joy of pairing wine with Japanese food? Yeah, well, I mean, first of all, like, you know, I think beer and sake was my introduction to Japanese food, um, and I love it. So I think, you know, for most people, I think that um, especially, you know, kind of with me in the 80s and 90s when you know, Japanese food, especially like sushi, was a little bit kind of on the rise, you would go in and, you know, have a beer and and, and have some sake. And I still do that today. And even, you know, if I'm if I'm drinking wine, I'll start with, uh, you know, a draft beer or they'd be like, Nama Toriaizu. <laughs> you come in and you know, start with a beer before moving on, uh, on to, to the wines. But I think um, really everything that I learned about pairing outside of sake and beers, I, I learned in Japan from um, sushi chefs and sommeliers that were a little bit more adventurous or innovative. 
So when I would travel to Japan, it's like you would just think like, I'll have a beer, I'll have some sake, and that's what you have with Japanese food. Um, but then I started seeing that, you know, champagne is, of course, a popular way to start a meal there. And uh, they love French and Italian cuisine. And people think of Japan as being kind of traditionalists. Um, and they have a lot of tra- you know uh, traditions that, that, are, that they should be very proud of. But they're also very innovative and they love trying other cultures and incorporating that into their food. So what I started seeing, there was in one place in particular, uh, it was a third generation uh, sushi chef who actually became a sommelier. So his father and grandfather, they were all these traditional like sake guys. Um, And he basically would go to France every year. And he's the one that kind of like introduced me to the idea of pairing Pinot Noir with sushi, which I never would have thought of. So my friend is like, you need to come with me to this place in Kyoto. And it's the small family business. And they do really interesting pairings with with aged wines. Um, and that was about that was a couple of years before um, I started, you know, the wines. And I would really see that there were a lot of places that would incorporate, in particular, Burgundy. Because I think Pinot Noir in particular is a very um, uh, it's a very flexible wine for pairing. And so I would see that, OK, there's a lot of these. Um, chefs and sommeliers really love burgundies, which, by the way, are kind of very expensive. Um, but then that led me th- to the idea of like, well, I live in California. What if I created a Pinot Noir that's done a little bit more in that minimal intervention, old world style, very elegant, and then be able to introduce them like, let me show you what California can do in that style. And then, you know, that yeah, that that eventually led me to, uh, um, yeah, to, to focus on Pinot Noir for for the mm. Japanese food market. Interesting. Yeah. By the way, what's the name of the place in Kyoto that you got inspired by? Uh, it's called okay. Hide Zushi. Okay. And uh, the chef's name is Otani-san. And it, it's kind okay. of interesting. It's in a kind of a, I think it's more of a neighborhood. Um, and it almost looks like just a house. And then when you, when you go in, it's, you know, the family lives upstairs and they have a beautiful sushi restaurant with a counter downstairs. And it's, you know, uh, the, the wife is there and the parents and they all kind of work together. Uh, so yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a little bit under the radar, but I've brought, I brought friends there that would just look, especially in the wine world that would flip through the, the wine list and they couldn't believe like seeing these seventies, eighties, nineties champagnes and burgundies at, at some of the prices that they offer are pretty, pretty incredible. Wow. I have so to I guess I'm making the secrets out now. <laughs> <laughs> right. But we, we, we have to support the kind of yes. unique mindset, right? Yeah. All right. So, and uh, you mentioned Pinot Noir. That was kind of the starting point of your, you know, the opening up for whatever is possible. And the best medium to merge Japanese with wine, I mean, how, why do you think Pinot Noir is the best way to just dig into more details? for yeah, Japanese I've, food. Sure, sure. Yeah, no, I've, I've always liked Pinot Noir when I, when I first started, you know, um, when I moved to California and we, we would do wine tastings. I, I love all the you know, varietals from, you know, from various regions. But I think when, when you talk to sommeliers, a lot of people will, will agree that in terms of versatility and food pairing, that Pinot Noir can cover the broadest range of styles. So certainly if we had like a Cabernet Sauvignon or like, you know, a Sangiovese there, there are perfect foods for that. But if you're trying to go as broad as possible, I think there's an elegance and a brightness and an acidity uh, to Pinot Noir that allows it to cover anything from seafood uh, to vegetables and mushroom and even into into meats and, you know, and red meats. Mm, So compared to something like... um you know, Cabernet Sauvignon, which is bigger, higher alcohol, and uh, more tannins in there. So I think in that way, Pinot Noir is kind of gentler and um, it's kind of forgiving, I think, for the Japanese food. Um, but have you ever considered uh, white wine as well? Yeah, I think it's it, it's 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 one of the top questions that that I get because people see that I'm very you know intrigued by like this Burgundy style thing. So there's there's a lot of people like, hey, you should consider you know, would you ever consider making a, a rosé or a Chardonnay? So that's one of those. It's like okay, that's you know that's interesting. But for now, I really wanted to explore and focus on on Pinot Noir and and because I understand that varietal the most, and I wanted to kind of get the most out of it. Um, but, you know, you were talking just a second ago also about 
the the bigger, richer styles. And there are people, especially uh, I think in the 90s and 2000s, that were also making really big and rich Pinot Noir in California. Um, and I think a lot of those wines were what people outside of the U.S. and in Japan would think of California. Like, oh, yeah, California wines, unlike French wines, they're big and they're powerful and they're fruity. Um, and, you know, those wines are really fun and I love to drink them as well. But there is a group of there's a, a growing movement of a lot of wineries that are backing off a little bit on that power and the alcohol and trying to do things more elegant. So, I, you know, I'm not the only one to do it. I think there, there are a lot of great, uh, you know, Pinot Noir producers that are taking a little bit more of that approach. They just maybe haven't gotten to Japan as much, but they, those have recently. And that's certainly something that I'm trying to do too, to show people that it's not just about big, powerful wines that, you know, California can produce really beautiful, elegant wines as well. Mm, right. Um, yeah, that's interesting, right? Because I think whole, uh, global warming and especially California is facing, um, very quickly changing, uh, climate, um, expressions, I think. So, um, I'm sure it's it's not going to be easy, but somehow you found the best vineyards and uh, sounds like you know the style and the direction and how to control it. So, yeah, and you you offers, uh, you, Zandasori offers four labels currently, all Pinot Noir, and uh, you, do you want to go through uh, what do you make? Sure. Yeah. Yeah. So there's basically, there's and one of the cool things about having made wine since 2012 is that, um, on my website, people can actually purchase some of my library wines so they can kind of see the evolution of the brand and the style. Uh, but the current release is 2020. And of that, so I make a, a blend that's just called Xander uh, from Santa Barbara. Um, and that one's designed to be a little bit more fun, a little bit more fruit than I would normally do, and oak to be a little bit more lively and generous, like not powerful, um, but something that in you know I would think of like, hey, if you went to Izakaya, or if you know, if you wanted to do something like that could pair with like miso eggplant or duck or gyoza or yakitori, unagi, those kind of things, like that would be a fun, fun wine to drink. And that's a blend of uh, Santa Barbara vineyards. Um, and then the next uh, wines that have a white label are my my two single vineyard uh, designates from, from that vintage. And it's kind of cool because they're each the oldest Pinot Noir vineyards from their respective regions. So one of them is uh, Sanford and Benedict from the Santa Barbara area, and that was planted in 1971 by Richard Sanford. So the first Pinot Noir that came to Santa Barbara. Uh, so very lucky to be working with with that vineyard and that fruit. And then if you go all the way up north into Sonoma Coast and Russian River, uh, there's Olivet Lane Vineyard, which was planted in 1975. So one of the first Pinot Noir for Russian River Valley. So for me, it was always like, let's go to the most iconic, interesting, best vineyards that I can find. And that gives you the opportunity to, you know, compare like, hey, this is, you know, something from Central Coast down south. And here's, you know, another wine that's made from a vineyard up north. Um, and then the fourth one that you mentioned, it's um, it's a, it's my black label pr uh, premium wine uh, called Ludion. And that's actually named after my parents. Um, my mother's name is Lutka. My father's name is Leon. Uh, so I combine them together to randomly, it sounds very French and <laughs> a little bit mysterious, but it worked out well. So it's a, yeah, and that's, that's a blend of um, three different vineyards, uh, six different Dijon clones. We probably put most of our time and effort into crafting that wine because it's a, you know, it's a combination of many barrels and, and, and vineyards and uh, Shalini uh, Shaker, my, my winemaker, um, we, we work a lot to do a lot of blind tasting, a lot of, uh, trying different blends and then also running them by chefs and sommeliers. So it goes through a very exhaustive multi-month process to, to get that wine. And interestingly, that's, it's my premium wine, but it's also our bestseller and, uh, has in the U S and has been sold out in Japan. It was just, uh, just replenished with a ship just arrived with some more of it. <laughs> so people seem to appreciate the the premium wine mm. as well. Right. Yeah, interesting. I, I tried one of those, and uh, that was 2020 Zander Sauron Pinot Noir Olivet Lane Vineyard. Oh, and, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I, yeah, I wrote tasting notes. I, you know, the color was, I really poured in the glass, like, wow, this is like a ruby, like very light, um, very uh, kind of glittery ruby. And I've never seen that light, transparent um, Pinot Noir. It's more like usually um, more dark red. That was 
really distinctively beautiful color. And then I got this like cherry raspberry, but it's a bit of smokiness. And、um, I don't know that eventually、uh, some kind of like a nori seaweed and a little bit of nutmeg kind of thing. So it reminds me of, oh, this is going to go well with umami because of nori seaweed notes. Yeah, it's almost like, like you're, you're literally like if I pulled out like my tasting notes, I think you covered like 75% of them. So you have a great palate. <laughs> <laughs> But、Thank、yeah, you. like very like red cher- cherry, raspberry, like people get sage and clove.、Um, and the smokiness, we even say it's almost like a little bit of a dustiness to it.、Um, it's our most inland vineyard. So we would always say, like, hey, our, our more coastal vineyards, that's great for seafood. And then Olive t Lane is a little more inland. So that would be good. You know, with grilled meats and fish or earthier dishes, you know, vegetable tempura, mountain vegetables. But interestingly, that is one of the best pairings for like tuna nigiri. So, you know,、mm-hmm. the, I think that t- there's a certain like iron content、um, that matches really well with the earthiness of that wine. So sometimes, yeah, well, it's, it's a, the olive lane has been very, very popular in Japan because it has that, that balance of like earthiness, but,、uh, but fruit. Mm, interesting. And it's interesting that you mentioned that,、uh, you know, the Akami, the, you know, the Japanese、uh, chef used a very sharp, sharp knife. So the sashimi, like your fish, the sushi or sashimi, the fish gets so smooth on the surface. And the texture or the body of your wine had that same smooth, like very fine mouthfeel. And I thought it was, oh, this is the sashimi surface. It's the same silkiness. And the smoothness. So I thought it was perfect with、uh, such a. Oh, thanks、too. so much. I'm, I'm glad you enjoyed it. Interesting, like red wine, people don't think、eh, Japanese food has to be with white or sake or something、uh, not red. But I like that rosy, like raspberry, something fruit or flowery really goes well with Japanese food. And why do you think is that? It's like、uh, some magical、uh, surprise to me. Do you have any explanation for that? Yeah, it's, it's hard. Like it, it, when you get into the, 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 the chemistry of it, it's like sometimes it's just a sensory experience that you try out. And I always, I think I've been lucky that a lot of the restaurants I go to are a little bit more like not, not experimental, but they're, they're innovative and they want to try things. So a lot of times we'll have multiple glasses of different kinds of wines on the table. And that lets us, you know, kind of try different things. And I, I think there's, you know, one, Challenging sushi pairing that you know is for for red wine at least is kind of more of like the silverfish, you know. So, if you think of like、um, mackerel, which would be like saba or、um, sardine, iwashi, and then kohada, you know, the, the traditional original、uh, sushi,、mm. I find those are, I would just immediately think like if you're going to have those, once you have some sake on the table, and then that's going to cut through, you know, the fat and the marinated elements of it. Um, better than maybe a red wine. But I've also been surprised that sushi chefs have told me, like, I remember one in particular that, you know, he had a sardine and a washi, and I was going to ask for some from sake. And he said, well, no, try, try it with your wine.、Um, and, you know, and again, it surprised me that it actually worked because I would just kind of discount it.、Um, s- same for Kohada. I went to,、um, you mentioned Sushi Saito before, and one of his top like, students. Uh, went off and started his own restaurant, which is、uh, Sushi Shunji,、uh, Shunji san. And his wife is a sommelier. And when,、mm-hmm. when kind of the Kohada came out, I had kind of the same thing. And I had one of my aged wines on the table. And she said, you know what? Try it with, with your Pinot Noir because we don't age our Kohada. They serve it a little bit more of a fresher style. So if you get into the aging and the marinating, it might pull you towards a sake. But、uh, a little on the fresher side, it, I was. Really pleasantly surprised. So, I love that's one thing I love about Japanese chefs and sommeliers is that they're really adventurous and they're they're trying new things and they want to learn. And、uh, there's, I don't know if you're familiar with、um, Sushi M、uh, in Tokyo, but it was created by the、uh, sommelier and wine director or, of Narisawa, which is a three Michelin star restaurant. And he had a concept the M in Sushi M is for marriage,、uh, the marriage of. Sushi with beverages. So, of course, you know, they've got sake there. They've got,、um, you know, various French wines. For, they, 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 I'm very happy to say they carry my wines, but they also do like cocktails. They've paired with coffee. 
Um, yeah, so Kimura-san is a very, uh, very interesting adventurous pairer. And he even goes so far as like he has a thermometer. He has the exact temperature that he likes to serve each drink with the piece of sushi. So there are some very, you know, passionate uh, people that are trying some some new and creative things in Japan. And I, I just love that yeah. part of the culture. Mm. <laughs> You're so geeky and I love that. I have to go there. <laughs> right. It's amazing. Yeah, because you make that wine so hard and very carefully. And why not, right? I know sommelier wants to serve the best. That really like the collaborative service. Um, yeah, and I, I want to really mention the packaging of your wine is almost like omotenashi, um, the hospitality in Japanese style. Do you want to talk about the packaging of your wine? Oh sure, yeah, and that's like I um I can't, my my father is a, an industrial designer, and I think working at Apple, I was also always surrounded by great design. Um, and so when I traveled to Japan, the other thing I noticed is just like you said, how how strongly they they are steeped in this you know this culture of packaging and gift giving, you know even how how gifts are are wrapped. Um, and I remember you would go into you know the 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 basement of a department store or a train station. And you have the food court, and every little stall. Not only is the you know their their food and the desserts beautifully presented. When you buy it, it comes in just a beautiful little box and a matching bag. Um, and I noticed that that extended, of course, into like you know uh, liquor and sake. And I remember falling in love with a particular box of uh, sake. It was a, a high end hakutsuru, I think called tenku. Um, and they, so they they have these these beautiful cardboard gift boxes that were like so precise, like the made, the way they were made. Um, and I had the, the pleasure of like meeting with the CEO and the company and kind of asking them and about it and meeting with the designer. And I was surprised to learn that that sake box that I fell in love with was actually inspired by the iPhone box packaging. <laughs> <laughs> so, so it kind of went full circle. So when I set out to design, you know, my own packaging and, and gift boxes, um, we did that in Japan. And, you know, we, we had them manufactured there. Um, so it's something I, I intentionally did not market with my wine launch and with our products. Um, but anytime somebody orders my wine, it comes in those gift boxes because we wanted that to be a, like a surprise and delight experience that, you know, something arrives and just the way that the layers, you know, reveal themselves of, you know, not only first you get the outer box, the inner box, uh, and then eventually getting to the wine. So I think that the visual identity uh, was very, very important you know, to me with uh, creating mm. this brand. Hey, yeah, it would totally raise this ex excitement. And also I think there's a sense of gratitude. And uh, I think it's, you know, good drink is great, but you want to have the experience right from the beginning, even before you drink it. Uh, this is something special. You got lucky to have this. And uh, your box is so like, wow, I, I was touching. The, the tactile experience is also great. So, yeah, oh, thank you. And I actually, really it also that. extended a little bit into my product photography. So another thing I love to do is uh, almost all of my product photography and the bottles are done in Japan. And I have a, a friend there who's a photographer. So we travel around the country together, just, you know, having fun and going to beautiful temples and gardens and having great meals. And then we'll take photos of bottles like in these, you know, in these beautiful settings that I think, you know, makes the wines look a little different compared to, you know, most Western brands. So it's been, it's been fun to have some grounding. It's, I look at it as a very much a collaboration between California culture and Japanese culture and trying to fuse them together into something interesting. Mm, hey, all right. So listeners, uh, you should probably pay more attention to the packaging, how Japanese people are so crazy about <laughs> presenting <laughs> something beautiful. Right. Um, okay. So, um, well, we mentioned how challenging it is to make um, your own set of wine, especially in California. So um, you have a great winemaker, an award-winning winemaker, Shalini Sakar. So, and with her, how do you manage to produce uh, such a delicate style of wine? Because you have the great vineyard that you have to make wine into uh, something you want, right? Yeah, so I mean, I'm very blessed to be working with uh, with Shalini. So yeah, Shalini Shaker is the first um, American-born Indian woman winemaker. And when I was making wines at Furthermore, you know, for this long period of time, they worked with a few different winemakers during that period. And I found that my favorites were the wines that Shalini made. And those were the ones that also resonated really, really well um, in Japan. So she makes her own 
uh, a wine under a label, Eau de Vino. Um, she also, like me, has a musical background. She started, uh, I think, as a um, kind of a concert uh, flute player, and she taught music theory in college. And then she, like me, later in life, she got the wine bug um, and, you know, and, and started making wines. But she has a very, I, I find it like a very elegant style and a soft, you know, a soft touch. A lot of people, I don't want to, you know, assign like a gender to the wines. When people say my wines are very pretty, um, they often, like in Japan, if they compare them to other regions, like in Burgundy, like Chambol Musini is known for these floral, uh, you know, really beautiful bouquets. And I get that a lot from um, from Shalini's wines as well. So, yeah, it's very much about um, balance and creating a wine that has, you know, a lot of layers, um, but also you know, being delicate enough to not overpower food, but to complement it. Mm, right. So, by the way, uh, we've been talking about how great you are in taste like, but then where can we buy your wine? <laughs> Our listeners are like, where can we? <laughs> right. So if, if you're in Japan, they're in a lot of different places, uh, you know, both restaurants and hotels. But the U.S. is a bit different. Um, so instead of in Japan, I have to rely on having a distributor and then, you know, all the support from kind of the, the you know, the restaurant and hotel community there. Um, in the U.S., it's a very, very direct connection. So uh, the wines are available on my website. Uh, so people can basically go to the website. Uh, there's just a one step to kind of apply as a, as a member uh, it's, it's pretty quick. There's no fee for that. Uh, but then, yeah, people can essentially just, uh, pick up the wines directly from me. And there's also, you know, I'm here in California and I have a relationship with a handful of restaurants who are also, um, carrying the wines, but unlike in Japan, it's kind of flipped the opposite. So it's really about, um, having a, a direct connection with customers and having them be able to order the wines from, uh, pretty much every state. Uh, in the U.S., except a, a couple that are more difficult for, you know, for licensing and compliance. Mm, right. I really hope that, uh, I don't know your product, production plans are, but I hope people get nice surprises. Like, wow, red wine can go so well. Like um, umami rich bluefish, like you mentioned earlier. I, I don't think I've really tried that bluefish and the Pinot Noir combination. I really have to try that. It makes sense, right? The connection of kind of like a sea oceanic note in your wine and also the rich umami and oceanic tones in fish. Yeah, sometimes, yeah. sometimes it'll work, sometimes maybe not, which is why I love having multiple drinks and you can kind of go back and forth. Like uh, Ikura, I think, is really hard. That one is uh, is maybe not as much of a, of a wine because of the fishiness, you know, and the, the briny saltiness of it. Makes it mm, a little bit tricky. Right. Yeah. right. Well, but it doesn't uh, always necessarily work with the other types of wine too, right? Like if right, you think right. it's Chardonnay, it's great, but then it's Chioki or something like, there's always something. And it's the joy of um, trying. And once you have a right one, you really can't forget it. So yeah, you're really expanding the joy of pairing food and wine. And the Japanese food is becoming so popular. And I know that sake producers even want to be more like, wine sometimes because why do you limit right as far as people can enjoy good food and good drink so I yeah i love even seeing you mention like sake and wine it's like uh richard joffrey uh who was you know the chef de cove at dom Perignon for many years now he makes his own sake in japan we're bringing that you know french winemaking philosophy partnering with with japanese brewers so it's a very i think it's a very exciting time in both you know, cuisine and beverages uh, in Japan, there's a lot of people doing doing cool stuff. Right. Yeah, actually, he came to the show, uh, episode 288, and that was uh, February 23, and uh, he shared amazing story. And I, I really like um, that mindset of why not, right? People looking for the best quality beverage, like you do. Right, Richard right. did the same thing. Uh, I'll have to check out so, that episode. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so if my uh, listeners cannot uh, get your wine as soon as they want to, maybe they live outside of Japan or the U.S. So what's your suggestion to pair wine with Japanese food in general? Yeah, I think I, I personally, because I have more experience with that, I think, you know, starting with Pinot Noir, um, Pinot Noir, you're Chardonnay if you wanted to, uh, to go on the white side, because uh, I think that's where I've seen chefs and sommeliers in Japan um, go to. So, you know, s- starting on the, maybe on the, on the French side. Um, yeah. So yeah, bur- I would say focusing first on, on Burgundy wines and maybe trying to find, um, 
producers that don't create super, super powerful wines. And if you can, um, a little bit of age would help. I think there are a lot of um, a lot of Burgundies and French wines, especially ones that use a lot of whole cluster. Um, you know, if, <laughs> if you can afford, you know, great wines like, you know, DRCs and a lot of the, the good Burgundies, you really have to sit on those for a while. So, but the, the, the key thing is, is just trying a lot of, uh, of different options and, uh, and seeing what works. Mm, right. And uh, don't be afraid of red wine because Pinot Noir, I, I really think um, I can vouch for it. <laughs> so, yeah. yeah, I think and to and, me, uh, like a little bit of a cousin would be um, Nebbiolo, mm. you know, from Northern Italy, I think is another mm. really beautiful, you know, acidic, uh, you know, acid forward kind of wine uh, that would probably also be really good with tunas. Mm, interesting, right? Um, I had a tuna, a sashimi, and gamay. That's to me, it's like a bloody bloody combination, and you never know what's the connecting point of food and wine. So, right, right, yeah, right. This, right, and I think it's interesting, right? The acidity. You think it's a Nebbiolo, it's such a tonic, dark, big wine, but the acidity helps. So, as far as you have that connection point, you can try something more adventurously. Yeah, so uh, I heard you're going to Japan in November. So where are you going, and uh, what do you expect to discover this time? Yeah, so it's one of the one of the things I love about being able to you know focus on this as my next career is that I can I can travel more and I can spend more time in Japan, and it it becomes a little bit challenging because I always I have my favorite places that I want to return to. Um, so, but I always try to force myself to visit. Uh, new areas and and new restaurants as well. So on this trip, um, in addition to like Tokyo and Kyoto, I'm going to be going to Kanazawa for the first time. Mm. Um, and I'm going to be going back to Fukuoka in, in Kyushu, kind of on that Southwest. And there was a, uh, another three Michelin star sushi chef, uh, Sakai, uh, Sakai son. I just learned, you know, he's been uh, recently carrying my wines. So that's an incredible honor. And I'm going to go, uh, uh, visit him and get to, uh, you know, they, they have uh, four different kind of uh, pairing menus based on beverages. So like all these different tiers. So they take it very, very seriously. Um, so I was able to get a, a lunch booking there. And uh, that's going to be a, a fun one for me. Mm, oh, interesting. I think you already introduced uh, listeners to how diverse now Japanese restaurants are, or not just serving great Japanese food, but they, a lot of them are really creative about pairing beverage and their food, not just sake and shochu. So that's exciting. Yeah, um, I've also found, oh. I think in general, the, the, the bar in Japan is so high, even for casual places. So it's, you know, I don't want to think like, oh, it's all about fine dining and, you know, and fancy meals. I love just going to a little hole in the wall or an izakaya. Um, I, I, sometimes I'm the most happiest if I'm, you know, the only Western person there and everybody's locals. Those are Those are fun experiences as well. Um, you know, when you walk in and everything, like every head turns, it's like, who is this? You know, <laughs> like, that's sometimes fun because then you really, really get the the local experience as opposed to, you know, the, the tourist friendly places. Mm, right. Yeah. And it's not so difficult to find that kind of place. And I, one of my trouble uh, in outside of a big cities in, in Japan, I, I never book any place and I fall across. I, there's an energy uh, coming out of the restaurant. You can see, you can feel it, right? And uh, I never, ever had that meal. I, usually it's really excellent. And yeah, it's, it's fun making either. friends. And I think with, with social media and like Instagram, it then becomes very easy to be like, oh, what's the Instagram for your shop? And then you can follow them. So it's, you know, when I, when I log in online and you just see all these people that, you know, we've met from, you know, different countries, that, that's one of the the really, really cool things, uh, the positives of social media. Mm, right. Well, I hope you can have a great time and we can come back for probably give us an update. Um, so what are your plans and dreams farther than the trip? Yeah, yeah. So it's, you know, I'm, I'm at the, still at the very, very beginning of this wine journey. Um, you know, last year I launched the brand in Japan. It's only been in the U.S. for a few months now. So I think I'm really just looking forward to trying to travel more, um, you know, expanding the wines both in the U.S. You know, right, right now the focus, at least in the first few months, has been California. Uh, but I want to, you know, travel around the rest of the country, um, and also, you know, the same for Japan. There are a lot of people that are encouraging me to try other countries. I think, given how small my production is, you know, I'm only making 400, 500 cases a year. So the focus for now is mostly, uh, you know, U.S. and Japan. 
but yeah, I'd say like, uh, you know, spending a lot of time traveling and, you know, meeting new people and making friends through, uh, through wine and great food. Mm, right. And you never know in three years, you may have like making 3000 cases or who knows. And I hope you <laughs> <Right>. can, uh, <laughs> right. Okay. So where can we find your updates online and on social media? Yeah. So my, um, my website is xandersorenwines.com, Xander with an X. Um, and I'm on social media, I think, uh, if you follow me on Instagram, it might be interesting to check out the J- the Japan one first because I've I've spent a little bit more time there. You know, it's been around longer, so it's Xander Soren Wines JP is the the Japanese Instagram, and then just Xander Soren Wines um, in the U.S. Uh, but it'll give you you know an idea of various you know restaurants and people you know enjoying the wines and some of the activities and pairings that that we've done. Mm, awesome. All right. So, well, thank you so much for joining us today, Zander, and uh, good luck with the harvest for this vintage 2024. Oh, thank you. It's been so much fun, Akiko. All right. So, listeners, if you have any questions or comments about the show or suggestions for show topics or guests, please contact us at japanese at heritagefeedernetwork.org or akikotema.com. Japanese is a weekly work program and is always available at heritagefeedernetwork.org as well as on iTunes, Stitch, and Spotify as a podcast. Engineer is Gabriel Gabriel Jane, and thanks for listening. I'll see you next week. <laughs>